Good afternoon. Um, I'm Keith Yamamoto. Uh, welcome to the last session of the day, of this first day of the uh, uh, grantees meeting for CERM. Um, this session is on knowledge networks, uh, and I'm uh, really privileged to be joined by a superb uh, panel uh, today. Uh, we really intend for this to be an informal discussion um, and, um, and should be quite interesting as we dive into this question of how we begin to aggregate and organize um, uh, our data in ways that we can really learn new things about um, uh, mechanisms of uh, disease, understanding fundamental biological processes and so forth. So let me start by uh, introducing the panel members. The first uh, is uh, Dr. Sergio Baranzini. Uh, Sergio is a professor of neurology at UCSF uh, and a member of the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute uh, uh, there here. I'm a UCSF faculty member as well. Um, uh, he uh, built a knowledge network, um, a critical component of the UCSF Precision Medicine Program that I direct. Um, and uh, has had a, a big impact. And he's going to tell us a bit about that. Uh, next is Rob Califf, um, who is head of clinical policy and strategy for Verily Life Sciences and Google Health. And he's held that position since um, November of last year, I believe. Before that, he was a um, professor of cardiology at Duke, now an adjunct professor there, and uh, former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, he created at Duke, uh, I believe he founded at Duke, the Clinical Research Institute, which is the nation's largest academic clinical research organization. And in all of his capacities, he's really had a major hand in collection, sharing, um, uh, privacy and security of data, analysis of clinical and research data, um, a major player in all those spaces. Third uh, is uh, Lola Fianju who is an assistant professor of surgery and of population health sciences at Duke. Um, she is also associate director for disparities and value in healthcare and director of the Durham VA Breast Clinic. Lola has looked at ways that data registries and other forms of big data and statistical analysis provide avenues through which population level variations can be tracked, assessed, and incorporated into effective strategies for reducing disparities in diagnosis and outcome. Next is Susan Gregorick, who is Associate Director for Data Science at the NIH. Uh, before that, she was uh, uh, also at the NIH for six years in uh, NIGMS, General Medical Sciences, overseeing computational biology and data science projects, among many other things that she was doing there. And before that, she was uh, for seven years at the Department of Energy, where she developed and implemented their systems biology knowledge base. And bef before that, she was a professor in uh, computational biology at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I should mention that Aaron is all, or Susan is also joined by Aaron Walker, a colleague of hers, a communication specialist in the Office of Data Science Strategy at NIH. And then finally, David Hausler. Uh, David is an uh, investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and professor of biomedical, biomolecular engineering at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, he is scientific director of the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute that many of you may know, um, uh, and former team leader years ago uh, for the Human Genome Project, um, and also um, a principal in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is a federated data ecosystem that um, I'll, um, I'm sure David will tell us a bit about. So, so outstanding group. It should be a fun, fun com uh, conversation. Uh, we, as I said, we intend to keep it informal. And, um, and uh, so please uh, uh, direct any questions you might have. We'll try to leave ample time toward the end for a question and answer session with these outstanding colleagues. So this session nominally is knowledge network, uh, but we're going to consider that topic from a broad perspective, starting by backing up simply to data. Uh, we all know that uh, data is the currency 
of biomedical, clinical, and population research. That's been true forever. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, um, it, it was certainly was originally the case that researchers were taught to guard their data, to keep the data their own, to keep the story that the data told their own. Um, uh, and because that was really our only ticket to recognition, reward, publication, uh, hiring, promotion, uh, fame, uh, fortune, well, not fortune early on, but, but now it's a possibility. Um, and of course, don't forget uh, to real impact. Um, uh, but now um, the world is immersed in data, uh, buried in data. Currently there are 5.2 terabytes of data for every person on the planet. And the digital universe is doubling every two years. So our capacity to collect and accumulate data seems virtually limitless. Uh, not only is there lots of it, but in, in, in most cases, the data are at higher resolution, there are shorter cycle times, lower error frequencies, uh, better and better stuff, big data. So with that, computers have stepped in, first for storage, which now has become its own challenge, by the way, but then increasingly annotation, authentication, standardization, visualization, uh, and, and analysis. And the realization that amassing more data, for example, by merging data from multiple investigators could teach us more, open new insights, tell a better story, have greater impact. Um, so uh, um, uh, it's begun to really change the way that investigators are looking at their data and, and been a driver for sharing that information so that the impact of your story could be better by merging it with uh, data of others. Now, the anxiety about guarding the currency uh, hasn't just gone away, so we'll hear about that. Um, but we can begin to see the power of databases, repositories, and data sharing. So this is all you know, not without complexities, of course. Uh, those old drivers, as I said, of the currency, of the only currency we have, haven't gone away. Um, so along with data sharing strategies, policies and even requirements have evolved. Uh, and common principles, especially as the cloud is more, being more widely used, uh, it's become important and it's become important for collaboration. Uh, the data must be fair, uh, that, that um, uh, notion of being findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, fair. And as I think we'll hear, the, those principles may be essential starting points, but as challenging as they can be, uh, they're not endpoints. And we'll, and we'll drill down on that a bit. Finally, the potential for AI-driven knowledge networks that bring together myriad different data types, uh, genomics and proteomics, of course, but images, uh, chemical and molecular structures, um, electronic health records, um, environmental exposures, the microbiome, um, social and behavioral determinants of health. Uh, and with all of those, the aggregate of all of those, the potential to really learn, to find patterns and correlations that suggest lab testable hypotheses, uh, that uh, infer the biological processes uh, behind disease mechanisms, or identify novel biomarkers, therapeutic targets, uh, or old uses for or new uses for old drugs uh, that simplify and accelerate and reduce the cost of clinical trials um, and uh, approval of novel therapies, and um, in principle can reduce the slope of the healthcare healthcare cost trajectory. So that's the opportunity. Uh, some might say that that's the imperative that is foundational for precision medicine, for using data in these uh, aggregate ways, uh, to build computationally a continuum of biomedical research that uses all of the information from basic clinical and population research to gain a perspective on health and health care with such high resolution that we can distinguish individuals and advise individuals about matters of their health or health care. Uh, not uh, statistical groups of people. 
So that's what um, sharing, uh, integrating, analyzing data, if it's done right, could bring. And for CERM, it would extend the use and power and shelf life and impact of the data uh, that all of you out there in the grantee world, CERM grantee world, are collecting and reporting and using to have uh, your own impact uh, in your areas of study. The question for CERM going forward is should CERM develop its own strategies and toolkits for data sharing and analysis, its own knowledge network, or integrate its data with existing toolkits and with existing networks? Which of, the, are the, which of those strategies will actually bring a, a rapid payoff and, have, and, and, in, and increase the impact of CERM data? So I think that that's one of the things that the CERM organizers will be wanting to be thinking about as they're uh, hearing and listening to um, the discussion of our panelists. So let's dive in. Uh, David, I'm going to start with you. Um, and um, uh, because you are the one person on the panel that actually has been a CERM grantee, you had you held one of the first CERM funded demonstration projects. Um, and, um, and you know, but I'll inform everyone else that CERM doesn't have a, a CERM wide um, uh, data sharing policy. It has a data sharing policy that covers one element of its work, which is its genomics initiative. Um, and for that, data are, submit, are submitted to your Genomics Institute, David. So why don't you start by telling us a bit about your project, um, uh, how you collected data, what you learned, um, and how um, uh, the data sharing is working for genomic initiative projects. Have the data been accessed by others, used for other research and so forth, um, anything that you may know about that. So, so tell us about your work and then about the data sharing that's going on within the genomics initiative that's going into your uh, genomics institute. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, it's been exciting working with CIRM over the years. Uh, CIRM is one of the organizations that we have helped uh, organize, distribute, analyze, and uh, basically make fully available their data. Uh, we've worked with several uh, institutes of the NIH as well, and with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and other uh, groups in, in a similar vein. And I think what we're seeing here is a new world that Keith, you uh, illustrated um, with your examples quite well. Um, where we're generating vastly more data than a single group can analyze and fully benefit from in a short period of time. Um, and that uh, means that if that group holds on to that data, it's wasted opportunity. So CIRM has encouraged uh, its investigators that are generating large genomic data sets, and this means uh, genome sequencing, but even more importantly, RNA sequencing and so-called ATAC sequencing and other high throughput methods for interrogating tissues and growing cells in culture. You can learn, of course, an immense amount about what your tissue is doing or what your cell culture is doing through these massive high throughput interrogation capabilities that we have. And I want to emphasize why we've jumped on these. Uh, tech drives research in a very fundamental way. And when we think about the advances, think about electron microscopes and so forth, how we've been able to see things we haven't seen before. Each time we get a new view on what's going on in the system that we're studying, and in this case, it's the tissues of the human body. That breakthrough is accompanied by a flurry of scientific activity using the new technology in investigations. What we're seeing now is a mass distribution of this technology that is unlike what we saw before in biomedical research. You used to have to get on the beam line 
for example, to do protein structure, think about electron microscope, uh, all of the very complex, very expensive pieces of equipment that only a few people would have access to. When those were driving it, you certainly had an elite uh, biomedical research community that had to maintain these very expensive pieces of equipment. And the cost did not drop like Moore's law. Well, the cost for genome sequencing has been completely different. The cost for genome sequencing has been reduced since the time we were doing the Human Genome Project. The first draft was completed in 2000, 20 years ago. It's our anniversary at this point. Since then, the cost for genome sequencing has dropped by a factor of about 10 million. 10 million cheaper, 10 million times cheaper. That means that we're in a position of generating enormous, absolutely enormous amounts of data and not out of a single center that holds one very expensive machine, but everyone doing research in any capacity, every clinical trial, all of these organized scientific and medical research activities can generate massive amounts of data. And because RNA sequencing and the other types of sequencing we mentioned all follow from the basic idea of reading DNA, they all become cheaper by an equal amount. So CIRM knew this was happening and they wisely said, look, we're going to have an explosion of data in this area. Let's organize it into a database. And that's what my group has done. Now we work with many, many disease areas uh, that in particular, we have glioblastoma uh, data from the Quake Lab at Stanford. Uh, we have wonderful uh, data on neurodevelopmental diseases uh, from Dan Geschwind's lab at UCLA and the Krigstein lab at UCSF. And the list goes on and on. Um, fantastic data uh, about Parkinson's, about ALS, um, about cardiac uh, diseases of various types. And all of these are studied in the context of assessing real tissues, but importantly, assessing stem cells that we've grown and differentiated in these different labs, we meaning the CIRM now, we've, we've managed to differentiate and create tissues of all types that are disease models. And by this intensive genomic characterization, we can compare what's going on in the actual cardiac tissue to the, uh, to the model that's grown from stem cells. It's important, it became important about halfway through the project uh, that if you were going to then actually apply the stem cells that you had grown ex vivo outside of the body is a medical treatment, you would certainly want them to be fully characterized from a genomic point of view. Um, a biological or a cellular resource as a therapy is quite different from a drug. So one can control the process of producing a drug so that you get uh, good manufacturing press, uh, practice in a very precise way. But it was only in the course of the CIRM initiative that we began to understand what this kind of good manufacturing practice would be for cell resources. And part of it is the full genetic characterization of that resource. And that's just now starting to be realized. So uh, these kind of experiments that we do, looking at all of the different gene expressions in the cells in either an organoid, an ex vivo grown organ model, or a real tissue, are all not only giving us amazing scientific insights, and CIRM organized this data collection primarily around the scientific projects rather than the clinical trials projects, but we're seeing that we're learning so much that this becomes relevant even in the clinical trial setting. So while we haven't merged into that world completely, we are at this point where we're about to make this bridge and I think it's an incredibly important bridge from these fundamental scientific studies where hypotheses are made, where things are learned, 
at an astounding rate. And the actual rubber hits the road in a clinical trial where you're actually using a cell, a, a living cells in a therapeutic situation. Um, the, uh, the world that we've created for sharing data is absolutely fundamental to this. The internet, of course, changed everyone's lives and reworked society in an amazing way. And we see that it penetrates into every sector of society piece by piece as it replaces the old way of doing things. You used to take a taxi, then you take an Uber, et cetera. Um, these kinds of things change and they, and they do so because they can scale, they can make things cheaper, and they can make things more efficient. So the kinds of technologies that we're seeing in genomics are the key. And the idea here is cheap generation of the data, but then you pay on the analysis and storage of the data. And that actually pays off. Rather than building an incredibly expensive machine that answers one very precise question, if you can build thousands and thousands of cheap machines that just churn out data and then use our modern data analysis capabilities to turn that data into knowledge and hypotheses, that is the way forward. And databases and data sharing are an integral part of that. And we, Keith, you had a brilliant discussion really of the issue. The, the social circumstance of this is very much based on the old biomedical research model where you have the PI doing the lab, it's their data and they wanna milk that data for several years and publications to advance that lab and they don't wanna share uh, that data with anybody else. But the more we share, the more we all get. And especially in this world where the data can be generated so cheaply it becomes the actual tissue sources that are the value here. And I would argue um, that we really need to share both the, the tissue resources and the data in a, in a way that everyone can work together to understand the complex phenomenon of biology. And we will need AI. I liked your comments about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. It is clear that no human being can even start to contemplate the complexity that exists within a single living cell. It's far beyond human intelligence to really comprehend in any sense. Certainly, even if you aren't fully comprehending it, to find all the patterns that are there that might lead you to a new drug, that's also something that's beyond uh, human capability. But it isn't for the new uh, artificial intelligence we can get we can, if we have sufficient data, and that's the big if, these AI programs and machine learning programs do not run on 100 samples or 1,000 samples in the old way. They run on millions uh, uh, of data points, and then they find the pattern. So we have to feed them big data if we're going to get a reward out of that, which means we have to share data in order to get to that point. Great, great. So let me ask you a specific question about the, the CIRM data that's been submitted uh, to your institute, um, and, and that's you know have 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 we already have we already realized uh, a gain from cross information that comes from having data from from many different cells and disease models um, that have been uh, in which sequences have been recovered submitted into your institute are, are they cross informing each other in any ways that are telling us about uh, biological pathways or disease pathways that um, are already becoming interesting? Absolutely. Uh, many of you also know that we run the, uh, the human genome browser, uh, mm -hmm. which collects not just CIRM data, but uh, data from experiments that are done with DNA sequencing and RNA-seq and other uh, modalities um, from around the world. All the best uh, experiments uh, are collected and put as tracks on this browser so that they can be downloaded and compared and contrasted and you can experiment with them and you can make hypotheses from them. And, and that's a way in which the CERN data lives in a larger world. So one of the answers to your question before, you know, should we build it our own or should we join a larger uh, data sphere? The answer is absolutely, you must join a larger data sphere. Uh, you must join your data with other data 
and mechanisms like the, the UCSC Genome Browser Database um, and the viewing tool, the browser, uh, allow people to do interactive queries on these very large data sets uh, in a way that has spawned uh, an absolutely incredible uh, amount of, of research. So we, we, we have citations in, well in excess of 50,000 papers uh, and most of the papers that use the data it's only in a URL somewhere. They don't bother actually doing a formal citation anymore. Many people view the genome browser as like the electricity. Like, where do I plug in? I mean, you, you don't credit the electric company. It's just there. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, sorry, a public utility. Yes. Uh, terrific, David. Great, thanks. So, so Sergio, let me jump to you. Uh, really, um, um, uh, you know, David talked about uh, the... Uh, uh, potential for AI machine learning tools to be able to look at massive amounts of data and extract uh, patterns and correlations that wouldn't be seen um, by the human brain or by looking at only a small set of data. So, so you've built a knowledge network uh, for UCSF Precision Medicine. Uh, tell us about the information commons at UCSF and your network called Spoke. Um, uh, tell us about how it uh, is set up and working, and and uh, how you know what you're being able to extract from it already from from the starting point where you are now. Yes, uh, glad to do that. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to, to thank uh, you and the organizers for inviting me to participate of this uh, exciting symposium. Um, so I, I would like to start by um, introducing the operating uh, philosophy behind all what we're doing in this context. So we recognize that data leads to information and that information leads to knowledge. And I want to make a distinction between what we consider data. So data is really uh, the raw material with which we work. Uh, facts and figures and numbers in a spreadsheet and uh, there, there is not organized in any particular way in or integrated with it. That's, that's data. And just to put things into context, uh, the world today has in the order of zettabytes of data digitalized. Uh, just for people to, to remember, a zettabyte is a thousand exabytes. A thousand exa one exabyte is a thousand petabytes. And a petabyte is a thousand terabytes, which is something that you might relate more on a daily basis now. So we're talking about orders of magnitude and the amount of data that we're generating as a society in the digital domain is astonishing. You mentioned that uh, each individual, uh, what each individual contributes, but if you put it in a different way, just in 2017, Humanity generated more data than in the 5,000 years of previous history, just in one year. 90% of the data today was created in the last two years. So this is the pace at which we are creating new data. And then we need to transform that into information. So not all data moves into the information realm. And what is information? We, we consider it to be contextualized categorized and calculated and condensed data. And only then we can, some of that information will be understood based on experience, based on insight, based on knowledge, based on intuition, that will be converted, based on know-how, it will be converted into knowledge. So this is how the challenge before us is how do we move from a world in which data is cheap and is vast, in which we can convert it into knowledge, which is actionable, which could save lives eventually. So um, the challenge as I see it is in particularly in biomedicine is that uh, in the biomedical domain, we live in different strata. If you allow me to share my screen, I just want to show one slide. Uh, and this is what I call the uh, hierarchical organization of uh, biological complexity. Um, so uh, 
we can start from the bottom up and, and we, we have genomic information, meta metagenomic, expression, proteins, cellular pathways, cellular processes, all the way up to the organism. And researchers can spend entire careers in each of these strata, which uh, span four orders of magnitude in space and five orders of magnitude in time. And now the challenge before us is to convert this into information by integrating it. As uh, David mentioned uh, earlier, it's impossible for any human brain to understand the complexity of this data within a strata, forget a, a, across strata. So doctors are trained to understand and treat disease, but they often don't go all the way down to the molecular of every patient that they see and understand all the metabolic pathways that are in, uh, in, uh, at play in the disease that they are trying to treat. So um, what we're trying to do is to take advantage of databases that are already accumulating large parts of the knowledge that we have accumulated as a society, as, as, as researchers. There's reputable databases that everybody consults and start with those and try to integrate them so we can navigate across disciplines in seamlessly. And so just to take a snapshot of that, this is my last slide, but I think it's illustrative. What we created is a graph. It's a graph that combines more than 30 databases. This contains more than 6 million nodes, 6 million concepts interrelated based on their biologically meaningful relationships as it is stored in each of these databases. So every single gene in the genome is represented, every protein is represented, every interaction is represented, every uh, compound uh, in, uh, that is uh, approved for uh, use in humans is represented, every compound that is experimental. So more than 1.5 million compounds are part of the database. If we know that the compound binds a particular protein, that interaction is represented. The recently added metabolic networks, bacterial uh, pathways, and so on. So the goal is to now allow investigators to transition, to navigate from any particular gene, from any particular disease, from any particular symptom, what it is connected to, what is in the neighborhood, what do we know about that? And it's very important when we do this to keep an exact uh, track of the provenance of the data. So where is this data coming exactly? Can we go all the way back to the paper that described it? And that's very important. And let me say that this was really um, uh, spurred. Uh, I always had an interest in, in, in bringing data together, but this project was really spurred by the federal government in 2017. They organized a, a workshop in Washington, D.C., of which Susan was part and several uh, federal agencies were part in trying to facilitate and foster research on open knowledge networks because they saw this as the future of, uh, of, of, of research to combine different disciplines into a single entity that could be navigated by computers, by artificial intelligence methods. And uh, this was really um, spearheading this effort. And now a few years later, uh, we've created Spoke with support from NCATS of the NIH, with support from the National Science Foundation. Uh, we've created this knowledge network that is now being used in conjunction, like you mentioned, with information commons uh, at UCSF uh, to create uh, profiles of individual patients by embedding data from individuals onto the network and therefore creating profiles of the network that are unique for each patient. And information commons uh, is a tool 
from the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute that uh, utilizes data from more than 2 million patients at UCSF that have been de-identified and certified so that this electronic medical records now can be used for research. So we're taking advantage of that. We're creating profiles. Every patient at UCSF, we can create a profile based on his or her electronic medical record after embedding some of those variables onto the network. We can use those uh, embeddings, those vectors as features that feed a artificial intelligence system to help us classify patients based on their characteristics that allow us to predict outcomes based on repeated measurements of the same individual, be that laboratory data, be that genomic data, be that clinical data. So we're utilizing this in many different ways, also for drug discovery, uh, by utilizing graph theoretical approaches, we navigate the network and find paths between a compound and a disease using the established relationships, the molecular and the uh, biological relationships that exist along the way. So there's many, many different ways in which something, uh, a knowledge network in the biomedical space can be used. And this is a super exciting time uh, data is vast. We're just trying to convince people to make data available, to make data uh, shareable and, and reusable because it's the future. Thanks, Sergio. So, so you mentioned that, you know, that the knowledge network is being used uh, in many different ways with many different applications. I'm, uh, I'm aware of some of the things that have been done to uh, be able to help um, uh, decision making um, in um, uh, uh, memory and aging and multiple sclerosis um, by really bringing the basic science discoveries really to the physician, the practitioner um, in real time that uh, really allows them to make more informed decisions. Um, uh, so so sit, 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 talk a little bit about whether um, uh, it is a simple matter to be able to build APIs that link um, uh, other um, uh, uh, groups with other interests, let's say CERM, for example, <laughs> um, uh, to this network in ways that will allow them to extract the kinds of information that they are looking for uh, as, this, uh, as the data are integrated and then inserted into this knowledge network. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's a simple matter, but it's something that we're doing already. Uh, so we're uh, interfacing with different uh, agencies and different uh, groups to create uh, application programming interfaces, APIs, that will receive certain variables from their data sets and embed that into the network and get back uh, their results. So for example, we're now working with NASA uh, to create profiles uh, based on genomic information from, uh, in this case, uh, mice that went to the International Space Station. Uh, we're working with uh, UCSF, of course, uh, different clinics uh, to embed clinical records. Uh, we're working also with the Genomics Initiative to start using uh, uh, UCSF 500 uh, panel um, or XM sequencing data, or even 23andMe data sets. So we're working with different groups of, uh, interested and we'll be happy to work with CERM in ways in which uh, we need to understand the kinds of data sets that they are generating, but uh, they could certainly be uh, interfaced with the network and, and extract the knowledge out of them that otherwise will be very, very difficult or time consuming. Great, great. Um, uh, so, so um, this implies to me, at least, that that uh, as as my uh, uh, colleague Don Gannon uh, likes to say, that the juice is worth the squeeze. That that yes, this is going to be a lot of work. It's going to cost some money and and take uh, some time for people to be able to build the systems that are necessary, beginning with uh, data sharing. Uh, but that uh, the payoff. Uh, is substantial and can make a big difference. So, so Susan, let me turn to you um, and, and uh, uh, hear a little bit about the battery of uh, 
policies and tools for data management and sharing uh, that you have uh, 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 assembled at the, the NIH and, and how it, um, um, uh, let's just say, helps grantees to adhere to those FAIR principles that, that I mentioned. Um, uh, so tell us about where you are with that and, and how these tools could be uh, used and deployed. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. And it's really a lot of fun to be here today. I think that um, it's a really exciting time to be in data science. Not only do we have an enormous amount of data available, as, as many of our panelists um, have mentioned, David in particular and Sergio, but we also have the capabilities to do really large scale analysis in part because of the capabilities of cloud computing and the way that we can democratize analytical uh, methods. And also the knowledge that we've developed, um, we build on each other's uh, work. And now we see some really exciting work coming out in artificial intelligence and knowledge graphs and, and large scale genomic analysis. I, I think that this is gonna be an exciting time and it's an exciting time for NIH. I wanna tell you about a few of our activities. I'm sure that these are all gonna um, be of interest. Maybe some will cause a little angst, so we'll see. But the most important thing that I wanna tell you about is the data management and sharing policy, which we fully uh, intend to have public in the Federal Registry, I believe in October, which is one month away, but there's still going to be two years before it's implemented. So you'll have plenty of time to think about this. And the requirements are that um, all grantees who uh, would be funded by NIH, whether you're funded by an R01 grant or you're funded through a center grant, or maybe you have an SBIR con uh, award or even a contract, all grantees um, will be required to submit a data management sharing plan outlining how they intend the scientific data from their work to be managed and shared, um, taking into account any potential restrictions or limitations that may be um, accompanying with that data. We do understand that there are some data that um, data sharing would, be, um, would require some um, restrictions. We intend for this um, data management sharing policy to have allowable costs because we understand that sharing and making data available does require funding. And so there will be allow allowable budget requests for grantees. Uh, we anticipate that researchers will share their data at the time of publication um, for most data, but they, data that um, would not be supported through a publication we anticipate that grantees would share that data, data prior to the end of their performance period for that grant that was awarded. So even when you're coming up for renewal, you will still need to share your data at the end of your first um, cycle. We intend um, for grantees to submit these plans with their application and to submit the budget justification. The budget justification will be commented on by peer reviewers, um, but the the plan will not be scored. It will only be assessed by our program staff. And then your plans will be incorporated into your terms and conditions. And then of course we'll monitor at regular, <laughs> excuse me, at regular reporting intervals, um, the data sharing that you're doing. So again, this would be uh, coming out in the federal registry in our guide and grants contracts, ideally in a November time period. The effective date would be two years post publication. So that, that creates a lot of excitement in NIH. We certainly intend for data to be fair, findable, accessible, um, reusable, and to the extent possible, interoperable. But there's a lot of um, ways in which researchers might want to think about sharing their data. We encourage NIH researchers to select a data repository or cloud computing platform that would exhibit the desired characteristics to, to support their data principles. And there are many different ways in which researchers may want to share data, but as a first stop, we hope that researchers would uh, find a domain specific or disciplinary specific repository. And we have a list of these open domain specific data sharing repositories. I think Aaron will put that link. It's the BMIC website. In addition, um, through the data science website, you can explore different ways to engage in generalist repositories when there is no domain or data type specific repository. And there's a really nice website by the fairsharing.org um, that will show you a general chart of the 
general repository comparison. And I think all of these tools will be really helpful if you're looking for repositories where you can share data um, to comply with the data management sharing plan. We certainly um, have learned a lot through our pilot with the general data sharing um, platform FixShare. We found that <laughs> researchers um, did use this platform, but what they asked was for greater metadata discoverability. We also support the community to um, have funding for the development of those community-based um, open access data sharing repositories through two different uh, requests um, for funding. Um, the Biomedical Data Repository, it's PAR 20-089, and the Biomedical Knowledge Base, it's PAR 20-097. So this is ways for, as a research community, you can uh, apply for support for your data um, repository or your knowledge base. If you have a large set of data, like for example, the sequence read archive, it's something like 32 petabytes. We've put this um, data set on both Google Cloud Service Provider and AWS. Uh, and we certainly would imagine that researchers might want to take advantage of Stride's cloud computing to store very large data sets. Um, and this is something that's possible through our Strides program. Uh, through Strides, we've um, leveraged 80 petabytes total um, within the cloud service providers, 30 million compute hours, and over 36 academic institutions are onboarded. And we do an extensive amount of training we've trained over 1,800 um, folks from grad students to PIs um, through strides. We also have a professional enhancements to optimize, for example, pipelines. And one of the projects that we took on was to optimize SRA um, all against all sequence comparison. So now you can um, use that uh, large scale analysis in three to four days instead of 12 or so months it would have taken before. These are just a few of the ideas that we're thinking about um, for how we can share data through funding of specific domain um, repositories or through general repositories or through strides. But really the promise of data is not in the individual data sets alone, but it's really in the comparative and correlative relationships amongst data sets. So a challenge of course is to develop those capabilities uh, that go beyond making any individual data set fair and having the ability to infer and model relationships on aggregated sets of different types of data underline one of the more difficult components of FAIR. And we're making great progress in the community with Sergio's work and with the work of the Biomedical Data Translator um, to really integrate all of these different databases in ways that allow researchers to infer knowledge and ask questions through comp uh, sophisticated knowledge graphs. I'm wondering in the future where we'll go with semantic artificial intelligence and the inference algorithms to create harmonized data models that make it possible to further integrate different biomedical data uh, sets across federated resources, something that's of um, imminent importance right now with COVID, and what we will do to extend FAIR beyond the sharing of individual data sets uh, in terms of dynamic schema, um, computation, computable metadata, and other ways. Because when I think of uh, making data fair, I think of that not as the end point, but really as the starting point for a much larger and richer conversation about data science. Let me ask you about the data science. Um, my understanding from looking at clinical trial data is that I am advising entities to um, uh, submit data sharing plan as early as uh, 2003, if I'm correct on this. And I was part of a group that wrote a, a science perspective about this that you may have seen. Um, uh, and so the data sharing plan was suggested and then uh, I think eventually required uh, for clinical trials. But but there wasn't as very much data sh actual data sharing that went on. Um, uh, and, and so my question is whether uh, you anticipate in these new guidelines that there will be um, required data sharing, honoring, of course, as you said, uh, that there are going to be restrictions on some of the data, and this is especially true of clinical data. Um, but but that um, uh, that there will be required data sharing to to insert a bit of a stick in the process, so that if people are going to be funded, they they are mandated uh, to um, 
to uh, submit to, to actually share the data. Um, and and in that connection, why not um, uh, include uh, the data sharing plans in the scoring of the grant um, uh, to make sure that something thoughtful and high quality has been uh, proposed uh, and then hopefully then carried out um, uh, as the people uh, uh, actually carry out their work. Uh, is, the, is mandatory data sharing something that you think can actually be built into these policies? Um, I do believe that we anticipate that um, researchers will outline to us how they do intend to make their data fair and how they intend to share their data. So our supposition is that scientific data that makes the research reproducible um, will be shared. And of course, we do understand that that might require um, certain restrictions. Uh, we, at this point, the diversity of the review, um, the IRGs and the review boards are so broad across NIH that we thought that it would be um, ill-advised at this particular moment to make those uh, plans scorable. That in the future may be a position that we would take, but at this particular moment, we thought that would be a, a, a fairly large step. So we, um, we, they're not scored at this particular moment, but they are required with the submission of your applications for um, your grants. Got it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, so you know, my my questions um, uh, in this regard of of, uh, of, of pushing uh, investigators to to um, share their data really stem from the fact that, as I said, this this notion of individual achievement that that's how grants are eventually uh, awarded. Uh, that's how promotion and tenure is uh, considered and granted at universities is looking at individual contributions and, and that really you know, motivates against uh, sharing and we need to build in mechanisms to do that. Uh, Rob, let me, let me turn to you. Um, in, in some ways, um, it could be said that you've worked uh, in this data sharing management analysis space um, in all of your uh, uh, career positions at Duke, uh, the CRI, uh, at the FDA, and now uh, barely uh, Google, um, and and that um, from working in that space all this time, you've developed a bit of a world view, a real world view, I would say, um, about data sharing that incorporates um, both the incentives and the disincentives and the pathways for for getting there. So maybe you can tell a little bit about that. Uh, I think our, my fellow panelists have taken the high road of the elegance of uh, data sharing and the amazing things that can be done, and I, I agree with that, but I, I'm going to take the low road here and talk about the nitty-gritty problems that I've seen in my career. I'll just run through them, and hopefully it'll be helpful to people as, as you uh, think about the practical aspects of this. You know, I was, I was just thinking... Uh, while I was listening to the, to the other speakers that um, all of my work has been in clinical data, sometimes delving into the molecular part, but almost always in the context of clinical research. So it's a bit different than some of the other areas that have been talked about. And I really got started with a clinical database that um, was part of the clinical practice at Duke and uh, this is in the 1980s, and it turned out to be pretty valuable. And we ended up uh, selling an instance of it uh, to a company that was developing uh, registries. Um, it turned out um, I was in charge of it at the time, and I didn't get any money for it, but uh, uh, no one knew that. And it was amazing. Everyone who had contributed to the database seemed to think they should get a payout when it was sold. Um, and that was my first real experience with sort of the negative parts of sharing people's data. I brought up the question of who owns it and who contributed to it, who gets the credit, who gets the money. And I'd say every step of the way, some version of the same issues has come up in the data sharing arena. And just to give uh, other examples I've been involved in that uh, many of which have had great outcomes, that one did too. It turned out to be very useful for predicting outcome of patients with heart disease and was used for a lot of other purposes. But um, I was very involved in the clinicaltrials.gov development 
as an advisor to the National Library of Medicine. And then, uh, of course, when I was at FDA, uh, we um, finalized the, uh, the final rule for clinicaltrials.gov. But it, it's another really interesting example. When we started out, um, the contention of the industry was that uh, even registering that a clinical trial was being done would destroy the industry because it would give away uh, vital information that was critical for commercial purposes. And after a long battle, um, that one was won. And then we got to registering results of clinical trials. And that was also a hard fought battle, but uh, eventually got in and now is required by law. But interestingly, um, once it was law, the industry has done a pretty good job with it, but academia has been uh, trailing very far behind. And I do want to give the NIH some credit here because initially um, NIH grantees were absolutely the worst, but uh, the NIH team really went to work a couple of years ago and, and it's uh, much better now. But it, it brought up a lot of issues that um, making your, uh, the data that you generated available to others um, raises a lot of concerns in the traditional uh, way that we work. And of course, since then, um, we also now have been involved in something called PCORNAT, which um, is a federation of health systems to do clinical research and uh, using a common data model, about a third of America's health systems are in this network now uh, designed to do prospective studies and uh, outcome trials. But what's evolved in that sy system is not actually sharing the data, but creating a federated analysis system so that the question is taken to the data in each health system. And I'll say a little bit more about that later because it's coming up uh, over and over now that we're moving uh, more and more to the use of electronic health records as a primary data source where the data changes all the time. It raises a lot of interesting issues about um, how to share data. And then finally, uh, I, I'm of course now in the Alphabet universe at uh, Google and Verily, and um, I would just say it's been fascinating to uh, try to get data from institutions to share for their uh, per for their common purposes um, and a lot of issues are uh, come up of course about privacy uh, value of data and um, uh, ownership of the data so when I thought about this in a practical sense, I sort of think of it uh, like a university where you have uh, 101 classes, 201 classes, and 301 classes, it gets more complicated. And when I think about 101, the way I say it is, uh, the way I think about it is, uh, that there's a principle that data sharing should be good. We now have a law in the United States that says, that research participants and patients have the right to share their data. Um, we have an ethic um, in consent that we get when we do human studies that uh, the purpose of human studies is to create generalizable knowledge. So presumably people want their research data to be shared. And sharing at every level of science increases the chance for discovery, insight and progress. So at the introductory level, it's pretty easy, I think, to get people to believe that data sharing is a good thing and we should all embrace it as a social good. Um, but Keith, I did enjoy your question about will the NIH require it? And um, I think the answer is uh, we're not quite to the place where everybody's fully accepting that they're actually gonna have to do it. Writing a plan to do it and actually doing it are two different things. And I hope we'll have some good discussion about that. As we go from 101 to uh, the 201 level, uh, there was a quote from New England Journal that I think um, exemplifies at least a soft uh, underbelly or the sort of uh, one of the concerns that people have, particularly with clinical data. And it was from an editorial by Longo and Jeff Drazen. 
uh, about something they call data parasites. Uh, and and uh, the actual paragraph is a second concern is that a new class of research person will emerge. People who had nothing to do with the design and execution of the study, but use another group's data for their own ends, possibly stealing from the research productivity planned by the data gatherers, or even using the data to try to disprove what the original investigators had posited. There's concern among some frontline researchers that the system will be taken over by what some researchers have characterized as, quote, research parasites, unquote. This caused a, a huge uh, controversy and uh, stir. And I think in the end, uh, Longo and Drazen said it was, you know, really meant to be tongue in cheek, but it does actually reflect discussions that I've heard many times along the way. So what about data sharing 202? Well, in that class, you would learn the reasons that people don't share data, even though they say they plan to. Uh, control of data is power. Um, there's a belief that data is worth money. Um, often, uh, not sharing data occurs uh, for a reason that people give that uh, they can't protect um, the uh, PHI that's in that data. Um, recently, a big issue in sharing data across health systems are concerns about revealing poor healthcare quality. What if you make your database available and people realize that you have a deficiency in your healthcare uh, that your system is offering? There are concerns about revealing poor methods or alternative interpretations of the data. And one that not enough is said about is that it takes a lot of work to share data effectively, and I'll say more about that in a minute. And then there's the protection of intellectual property. Um, and the second part of the 202 class for me would be to make the point that transparency can be increased by education and work on culture. That is, um, unless you consciously instill it in the education and training uh, of investigators, it's going to be very difficult to get to the point where people are freely sharing data. And then you have a number of informatics issues that have already been referred to. The ingestion, curation, federalization, harmonization is, is all crucial and it does take a lot of work. And the better the planning that's done, the more effective the data sharing will be. This has been really fascinating for me since I've been at Alphabet because uh, we do deal with a lot of very complicated um, big data sets. And I'm very impressed with the amount of work that goes into just, just uh, curating the data uh, in these data sets to make it usable. And then finally, the uh, data sharing 303. And um, here I think there's a lot uh, of interesting uh, tactics and work that can be employed. The, the first point I want to make is that um, Laws actually work in this regard, especially when they're enforced. So it was one thing to say um, that we'd like for clinical trials data to be shared. It was different when the law said um, it's illegal to not share the fact that you're doing a clinical trial and now to share the results. And now with the uh, finalization of the rule, there will be some monetary penalties for those who don't share. The second is if it does become part of the culture, public humiliation works. And it was really interesting in clinicaltrials.gov to see what happened when uh, a scorecard was put out of the degree to which institutions were complying with registering their clinical trials. Some pretty big shot institutions suddenly put out statements about how committed they were uh, to complying with the law. And then there's a, a really important area of developing best practice for sharing data. Um, if there are gonna be data sharing plans, I can accept that right now, the variation is enough that you can't um, judge those plans easily. But I, I think as we get more data sharing plans, uh, analysis of the plans themselves and how well they work will be an important 
activity into itself. And certainly important in that to pay a lot of attention to uh, data provenance, data standards, and uh, metadata, which have already been mentioned. And within that also, there needs to be funding allocated to share data. Um, it's not very helpful in the clinical research world for people to get a raw data set if they don't understand the context in which it was uh, collected and the definitions of the terms uh, that were used. And then finally, there's work in progress, which um, I, I think are some, some really interesting areas. Uh, there is an effort now to try to understand how to give credit for data generators. Um, although we'd all like to say we do it for the good of mankind, as Keith, as you pointed out, when it's related to your uh, promotion or to your next grant, um, it's really important that you get the credit if you um, did a great job of making data, putting data together that turned out to be very useful for other people. But how to do that uh, is not worked out yet. And then there's this issue of federated sharing. Are there ways to share the data without actually uh, physically um, giving the entirety of the data to someone. And this is particularly important, as I said, in the area of electronic health records and other uh, clinical data that's also used in clinical care for a whole variety of concerns. And then finally, uh, the complexity of secondary data use in the clinical arena uh, where the data set changes all the time. So I hope this has been uh, a little more down in the dirt, but may, I hope this has been useful um, for people to think about uh, the issues that happen in the practical arena of sharing data. Great, Rob. Uh, yeah, I think it really is important to, to kind of get into the real world on this. Um, uh, your, these three stages of data sharing make it sound like it's, uh, it's going to be a steep hill to climb. I think that uh, we've got a long way to go. But uh, let me cycle back to you, David, because um, uh, I know that you are uh, were a principal in in um, setting up uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, and and um, uh, that group has done lots of remarkable things. It's a big consortium, um, uh, and 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 uh, uh, it's over 400 institutions and in, in over 70 countries. Um, and they, they've done lots of uh, remarkable things, but two of them uh, in, stand out in my mind. Um, one is the uh, API that was built to allow disparate technology services to exchange uh, data. Uh, and the second was a framework for sharing of genomic and health-related data um, uh, that really was signed onto by all of these members and all of these different countries and cultures. Um, can you, and so it really seems to speak in, in some ways to the kinds of complexities that we've heard about from uh, Rob. Um, can you tell us anything about how that's working in this huge multinational, multi-sector coalition? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Keith. Yes, there were seven of us that founded the uh, Global Alliance in, in uh, uh, you know, about eight years ago. And that um, the the kinds of things that Rob so eloquently described were what what motivated us. We saw that there was enormous opportunity, but um, very many obstacles, uh, as uh, listed uh, by Rob. And the way to do this is is to have the carrot and stick, uh, social pressure and social reward uh, for sharing data. Uh, so we. Uh, organized it recognized that the problem was an international problem uh, not one country uh, has a monopoly there's not a single country that has a monopoly on all good genomics data uh, we talked about thinking about biomedical data uh, writ large and we realized that that would bring in so many other aspects of this that we decided to fo focus the organization on genomic data and hoping that that would demonstrate the way, so light the way, let's say, for other uh, data types. In practice, we have uh, looked at all different types of data, data types, even though it's called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, 
the organization now uh, led by you and Bernie, uh, who leads the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, has grown a lot over the years. As you said, more than 400 institutions have joined. Uh, we represent um, many, many countries all over the world. And those people who join on expect to be part of a network that will recognize them for their contributions and to get the rewards of being part of that network. Uh, I think the, uh, one of the rewards is using some of the APIs and standards that are developed so that it makes it easy for you, especially if you're uh, coming up in the world, your institution or your country um, is just uh, trying to play catch up uh, with others in terms of your sophisticated use of electronic databases in the genomics area. You can catch up fast by joining the Global Alliance and we help you, we train you. Um, and that's the inducement for joining. And the other part of that though is you're expected to contribute. And, and so uh, this declaration uh, of a framework for sharing uh, was worked out carefully uh, by many people um, I, I, I can't mention them all, but Bartha Knoppers uh, uh, is one of the key uh, people who has spent her life uh, working at an international level and has been deep in the trenches. Uh, for example, the European privacy uh, laws that uh, were, were the subject of so much work over the last several years had some rough edges that would uh, possibly make it difficult to share genetic data. Um, and she worked very hard with many, many others in the trenches, so to speak, uh, to get a, an international agreement. One of the things that we ran up against, of course, is the exceptionalism of genomic or genetic data. Somehow uh, it, this is viewed as revealing something intensely personal uh, about you um, and so privacy concerns are paramount in that respect and distrust abounds. Uh, so, the, so the distrust leads to uh, easily in our current uh, geopolitical environment into simply passing laws that make it impossible to move data from one country to another. Um, and that has been, it, it's been a very, very, uh, difficult uphill battle to overcome these. We've come up with some interesting compromises. Um, rather than try to simply rewrite all the laws, uh, we've looked at the concept of computation on data that you can have uh, official jurisdiction over and control over in your own, within a, your own geographic boundaries, if you like but the computation occurs uh, with what's called containerized computing. So these are, these are, this is computer code that's written to be portable and it's vetted by the international community as, uh, as good code, not doing that doesn't surreptitiously do bad things with your data. And, and uh, it can put out summary statistics um, and do actually advanced machine learning analysis on data uh, but it can do it in place. So for example, uh, pick a random country X. Um, I don't know, I don't wanna pick on a specific European country at this point, but let's say uh, Belgium, all right? Um, I, and it really is random choice here. Um, they're, they, you know, they have a lot of genetic data and they wanna share it, but they don't really want it to leave, the, the raw data to leave their national boundaries. So they can host uh, a system in which these containerized computing comes and computes on their data and it equally can compute on other data and then aggregate the results. Uh, and that allows you to maintain jurisdiction over your raw data while still sharing it for the purposes of advanced computation and knowledge um, with everyone else in the world. And that has been a very important compromise. This requires a lot of API work. So this has required uh, a, a quite extensive amount of development. Uh, there are, but now containerized computing has become essential. It will run on any of the cloud platforms. 
or it will also run on uh, on a, a what might be called a private cloud or a you know restricted non-commercial cloud, um, and that allows people to again uh, have that jurisdiction that they feel they need. Now the next level, and Rob also mentioned this to a certain extent, is uh, cryptographically encoding the information uh, so that you can get certain statistics out of it, but can't get can't reproduce the raw data from the encrypted data unless you have the key, uh, and that um, that has become even more challenging. Uh, we're making in, important strides in that area, and there are a number of uh, queries that you can do efficiently now on strictly encrypted data that can be freely shared without uh, with no chance that someone's going to decrypt it and get the private information out of it. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's tough going. And when you get into the game of trying to prove that there is no algorithm that can decrypt the data to get X amount of information out of it, um, it becomes a quite a technically, challenging, um, a technically challenging area. And we suffer from uh, slow algorithms, basically. People are not willing to, to uh, take a tenfold reduction in speed in order to have this additional cryptographic protection. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to work harder on those. Uh, but mm -hmm. moving, let, and I'll give you the buzzword. What we did was basically move the compute to the data. And that's how we solved most of the international da uh, data sharing problems. So the data remains distributed around the world in its own jurisdiction, uh, but we move the compute to the data. Great, great. Well, it's very encouraging. It's, it's, uh, it's been inspiring to me to, to watch the Global Alliance work and, and uh, as make as much progress as we have. So that's really great to hear. Um, uh, Lola, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> um, thanks for, for being here all this time. Because um, uh, uh, I think that your work um, uh, kind of brings uh, to light another really critical element uh, that we need to be thinking about when we look at uh, data, big data, um, in that you've really illuminated ways that, uh, that big data and its analysis can, can uh, put, a, put a bright light on disparities in diagnosis and outcomes. Uh, and potentially, uh, those the same data can um, uh, reveal or suggest at least ways that the disparities can be overcome or at least reduced. Um, and in, in some ways, this seems to me to be one of the most crucial applications of big data in health and medicine. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, well, thank you for having me. Um, I will apologize in advance in case a young child runs into the room. I'm solo parenting tonight. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, so this whole conversation has been very interesting. I've been listening peripherally while um, getting my children dinner and then joining the call more formally. And I was struck by what one of the earlier panelists mentioned about how you know the majority of the data that currently exists was accumulated in the past couple of years. Um, and I thought about the extent to which we have such a poor sense, a poor intuitive sense of scale and the way that you see that is in the debates about how a mask can protect you from the coronavirus, but you can still smell through it. Now, as a surgeon, I'm someone who wears masks all the time. And so um, this whole debate as to how masks are bad for your health and how they can impede your ability to consume oxygen is laughable. But again, it reflects to me the fact that people don't understand that when we're talking about viral particles, we're talking on the scale of microns, but when we're talking about smell, we're talking on the scale of nanometers. And then you're talking about terabytes at the other set end. And so when you're talking about, you know, 20, 30 orders of magnitude, many humans can't wrap their mind around that. And the reason I mention this is because I think we need to appreciate how, as interested as we are, in freeing the data and bringing the data back to the people in order to ensure dialogue between those who are providing their data and those who are analyzing the data, that we need to think very seriously about the language we use and the education and numeracy and scale that will be required. And the reason I think this is important is because one of the challenges in this era of big data is getting people to trust that their data will not be misused. 
And if we can't even give people a sense of the scope and scale of the data that's at hand, we're gonna have a really hard time convincing them that's not gonna be misapplied or potentially used against them. One of the challenges with stem cell research, which I know is an important part of CERN's mission, is that it almost feels for many patients or many people who listen to it, like you're talking about science fiction. The idea that you can go in and fix parts of the body that no one else can see, and that will lead to a large scale change in how someone lives out their disease and may even cure that disease. And I think that at the, every time you think about some major innovation, you have to think about the extent to which some groups will view that opportunity for a change is an opportunity for manipulation and opportunity for subjugation. It's how do we believe that this form of cell therapy isn't actually the equivalent of smallpox covered blankets. And I know that seems very hard for people to remember, but I think it is something that now scientists across the board are becoming aware of this level of mistrust as we try to gain traction for a belief in and compliance with a future vaccine. So with regards to the data and the work that's being done um, by grantees for CERM, what I would implore everyone to do is to think really hard about how you would describe your data to someone who is a lay person and doesn't know what you do and doesn't really understand fully what it is that they're doing and how it might apply to you or someone they love. I think that you know people talk about how the measure of character is what you do when no one else is in the room with you and what you say when no one else can hear you. And I think that that's something we need to think about as scientists when we think about generating data and analyzing it and putting it out for public consumption. And this brings me back to how the data is collected in the first place. The truth of the matter is that we spend a lot of our time reconciling data that's already been correct, collected during a period when we weren't working in terabytes and during a period where things were collected by hand, during a period where doctors were dictating their medical record notes and they were being typed by an equally fallible secretary and then being put into filing cabinets. We're merging that data with the enormous scale of genomic data that's now being put out. And we need to somehow convince the public they can trust us with that merge. They can trust us with properly curating the data that was generated during a period that was known for racism, known for misogyny, known for xenophobia, and that we're not going to still bring all the biases that led to the collection of that very biased data and then apply it to the data we're hopefully curating in a less biased way now. So I'm really happy to serve as a resource to think about how we collect data and how we can make sure that when data is then reported, um, people feel that it's being used for their benefit and not being used against them. One thing that's incredibly important is that whenever you're talking about genetic data and talking about how it's going to be applied, it's critically, 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 critically important to realize that although it is often used as such, race is a highly, highly imperfect proxy for genetic ancestry. And it's an easy truth to miss, and people often use the term race as a social construct as kind of a throwaway term but really the extent to which it's frequently misapplied and misthought of as equivalent to genetics is really, really can't be overstated. So when you're collecting data from patients, one, I would strongly recommend that people ask what pe racial background people identify as. You can't necessarily take for granted that whatever's in the record is going to be correct. A lot of cancer registries and other forms of mass data collection actually have algorithms which they determine what a person's primary race is, but in an increasingly browning world, we need to take seriously that people may have multiple racial identities, and it's important for them to tell you what that is. It is important at some point, if you're doing stem cell data research, not to, again, think that everyone who falls into a particular category with regards to race should also be grouped in a particular category with regards to um, genetic classifications. And I think that's really the beauty of when you're working at um, the molecular level, is that you don't have to rely on these massive heterogeneous social constructs to group people. And so to the extent that you can free yourself from these categories that we use in so many forms of reporting and so many types of science and research, um, that is where you can let the data actually free us from the constructs that currently bind our thinking about how the world looks and where we all fall and where we belong. Next thing I was mentioned is that when you start coming up with a plan for how you're going to collect your data, 
you need to think about whether or not you have any type of patient advisors as part of your recruitment process and as part of your plan for data and research dissemination. A lot of people say that they want to get the patient data back to them, but they don't really have a plan for doing so, nor do they know the, the format or the timing or the frequency with which that data should be reported back. Some funding agencies such as PCORI actually do quite a good job of requiring that as part of your initial submission. But as someone else was mentioning before about different ways that we might soon be scoring applications, I suspect another important thing we're going to need to start doing is that applications need to be scored about their recruitment process. And that if you're going to be publishing in a high impact journal, there needs to be an explicit explanation of the research and recruitment strategy for ensuring a diverse cohort of individuals. Now, in the end, all of this will hopefully lead back to there being greater trust by the public and the scientific community with the data that we're acquiring for people every single day. Um, and that's going to be important not only to have more people continue to participate in science as participants in research, but also to have more people take advantage of the benefits and the boon of scientific research, such as vaccines, when they actually become available. In many ways, you can't, you can't fault people for being unwilling to participate in research they ultimately think may not benefit them or that they cannot trust. So my parting thought is to simply think, one, be very conscientious about how you're collecting the data, how you're acquiring the patients who are going to be participating in your, in your research. And then next, be thinking about how that data is going to ultimately be communicated back to those individuals, ideally using the viewpoints and language and vocabulary of patients themselves. If we recognize that we're really talking about such different concepts of numeracy and concepts of scope and scale, that gives us just a beginning of an insight into why we need to do a better job of explaining science, explaining its purpose, and showing human beings their context within it. So those are my parting thoughts. I'm happy to be a resource for anyone who has questions in the chat or what have you, and also happy for anyone to contact me afterwards if they have questions. Thanks. Great, Lola, well, thank you. Uh, let me just ask one follow-up question. Yeah, um, uh, you, you made the very strong uh, an important point that race um, uh, is a, a highly um, uh, non-dependable uh, tra track to biology, um, and and, um, and and so there there's it's very unlikely that we're going to be un uncovering the you know I think there there are many scientists who who think at least kind of in the in the back of their minds if you put it this way that that as we learn more information then we'll actually be able to trace the genetics of race. Um, uh, and, and the social scientists have been telling us for a long time that, that that's not true. It's a social construct, uh, that many of these things we're discovering, you know, in, in for example, in, in COVID study, population studies um, about uh, these uh, racial disparities in, in uh, more, um, uh, morbidity and mortality um, with, with COVID. Um, uh, all of these things, I think, just keep, keep continue to bring up this notion in people's minds that that race is going to uh, track to uh, uh, biology, to genetics, um, and and so how much of damage are we doing in continuing to be able to categorize uh, these uh, our studies in this way? Um, uh, and and even though the messages are clear that the what tracks to these disparities um, is, is not some genetic mark, uh, but instead um, uh, the people's, um, uh, the people are in essential uh, jobs in which they got to continue to go to work and collect. They live in housing where the many people are jammed together. All of these things that can be uh, traced and explained well, but there continues to be this notion that we have to have um, uh, representation of different races and categorize our studies in this way. Uh, it does, it doesn't, isn't that doing damage to this whole notion of being able eventually to be able to uh, 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 convey these messages clearly and that, and that, as you said, that that is a critical element of being able eventually to gain trust of the people that we need to be uh, studying and, and, and need to be benefiting from the studies uh, down the road. Should, do we need to change the way that we're messaging this and constructing our trials that have these race categorizations that are, are constructed? You know, I think that with regards to race and ethnicity, it's really hard to strike a balance between 
not discounting it and saying it's a social construct and therefore we can ignore it versus putting so much faith in it as a truth that um, we can make kind of essentialist kind of uh, claims about why we're seeing certain phenomena in certain group. I think that when we do research, we need to think about why we're mentioning race. I think we need to think about what role race is playing in our study. And in a lot of ways, often, race is serving as a marker for the multitude of sociological factors that have impacted that individual up until that moment in time. And I think one of the things that's been so interesting about COVID-19 is that when you look at how it's manifested itself in diverse countries, such as the United States or Canada or the United Kingdom, Obviously, each of those three countries has different proportions of people of color, right? Different proportions of individuals who are of African or South Asian or Latin American ancestry. And in the end, what marks who is sickest in a given society is which brown people or black people are at the bottom, right? So that means that if you are South Asian and you live in the United States where there are generally better health outcomes, higher socioeconomic status, you are not seeing the same types of manifestations you're seeing amongst people who are the descendants of Bangladeshi immigrants in the United Kingdom, right? So that tells you right there, these are people who, you know, are roughly from the same part of the world in terms of three or four generations ago. You're not seeing the same outcomes because the sociological forces that have shaped not only the individuals at hand, but the generations that preceded them in those new contexts are wildly different. And I think that that's almost in some ways, hopefully opens people's eyes to the fact that so much about the life that a person lives is about the latent factors, the unmeasured things that contribute to their existence as a black or brown person in the United States. And that isn't to say that race isn't real. And I, think, I think it's easy for us as you know, clinicians and as biological scientists to say, if it's not biological, it's not real. No one's saying that. We're just simply saying that the truth of race is understanding the way in which it is the result of multiple interacting social forces. But it doesn't mean it doesn't nonetheless have an incredibly powerful effect on the lives being lived in those bodies. That's great. So, I mean, I think that we just need to realize that this is a profound uh, component in how we think, as you said, scope and scale of our studies um, uh, and the ways that we um, uh, communicate that information in, a, in ways that can help to increase, generate trust, uh, as opposed to the opposite, and, and a, a critical component of the kinds of things that that all of the panelists have been been talking about today. So, um, uh, very helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, so, I think that what we have um, uh, really brought to the table with this. Uh, outstanding group of commentators on, on this topic of, of uh, uh, data, data sharing, knowledge, knowledge networks, um, is that there are two um, intersecting components that need to be um, uh, uh, considered. Uh, the technical, uh, the complexities of uh, uh, building these data sets, um, being able to put them together in repositories that are um, uh, informative, uh, representative, inclusive, um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and really build uh, technologies that will allow them to be, um, uh, to inform, to advance our understanding of biological processes, disease, and so forth. Um, so there's a big technical side that we really need to take on, something that, that um, a CIRM needs to consider as they think about moving forward with this uh, notion of being able to kind of uh, increase the, the, the useful life of the data that's being generated by the CERM grantees. Um, and then there's the social side. Um, and understanding is the kinds of things that, that Rob talked to us about, um, that, that um, there are social forces that are historical that um, are being brought to bear. Some of them are being um, continue, maintained with uh, policies that we have in academia and in funding agencies. Um, uh, and and uh, we need to examine, think about ways to overcome um, uh, in order to uh, allow um, the kinds of sharing 
uh, of information that will, will uh, really serve us. Uh, some of the things that the Global Alliance are doing are, are pretty heartening in that regard. But lots of issues, um, uh, both technical and social. Uh, but as I said earlier, um, mimicking, uh, uh, channeling Don Gannon, um, the juice is probably worth a squeeze. We really will gain a lot uh, by being able to overcome the challenges um, and move forward with uh, kind of the open science environment that, uh, that uh, you know, we all know uh, will really serve the overall endeavor.